who said I'd truly fall when I told him I'd given Jesus my all. And I guess I really can't blame them for having their doubts. For they only knew what I used to be. But oh, what a difference the Lord made in me. What I still choose to serve the Lord faithfully, but I cannot begin to imagine what he has in store. For once I was lost, I was headed for hell, but then I got saved, and now all is well, and my forever began when I took the prayer. Philippians chapter number one, once you find your place, stand with us, and uh, I'm glad that you're here tonight. I mean that. I'm thankful uh, that you're here. I, there's a lot of places that you could have chosen to go, but I'm thankful that you came tonight to church, and I, I believe this, I believe that God's people uh, ought to be in the house of God. I just believe that. I mean, I just believe that. I believe God's people ought to be in the house of God when we can and able, but I believe that God's people ought to be in the house of God that God put them in. Four of you believe me. And uh, you say, why is that important? Uh, these are our people. These are our people. And I know there's times of vacation. There's times of sickness. Uh, I understand that. But I am grateful when God's people uh, are in the place that they believe that what they say, that this is where God wants them. And, uh, and so thank you for being here. I mean that. Thank you so very much for being here. It's a great encouragement to, be, uh, to me. I was in the dorms this past week. And I really thought I was going to preach this Sunday. To be honest with you, this is really what was on my mind and, and on my heart. And I understand that uh, what was preached on Sunday was, was tremendous. And it was uh, a really great presentation of the gospel. And, you know, the Lord knows just exactly how to get some out of the way and put some in. And, and he knows how to get his message across. And I'm thankful for that. And, uh, but I, I, I was sitting in a dorm room. And I don't remember if it was Tuesday morning or Wednesday morning. Uh, but I was just doing some devotions. I think uh, maybe Andrew had already, uh, had already left and, and uh, went to meet the teenagers, and I was just sitting there, or maybe he might have been reading uh, over there, but whatever it was. But I come across these verses, and you ever just read, and, and you, you're just casually reading, and then all of a sudden it's, it's like something just kind of jumps out at you. And uh, now nothing jumped off the bunk, nothing you know yelled at me or anything like that. But I begin to read these verses, and I just want to share with you tonight uh, my heart, and I hope that'll be all right, but I just want to share with you what, what I believe the Lord done in my life 
uh, out of these three verses. Let's, let's begin reading down to verse number 9. And this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. That you may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense to the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. Let's bow together for prayer. Dad, take us Lord in prayer if you would. Amen. Thank you so much for standing. <clears throat> How often do we hear the words, hey, praying for you. Hey, just want you to know, praying for you. Uh, or do we say those? Do we say those words? And uh, sometimes we say it and we really got to go back in our mind, have I really been praying for them? You know, hey, want you to know I'm praying for you, praying for you, praying for you. And uh, that, if we're not careful, that can be such a generic terminology. Now, I, I know we, you know, we try to hit everybody in our prayers. You know, Lord, bless everybody. Bless the people of the church. You know, Lord, meet all the needs. Bless all the missionaries. Feed all the hungry. How, you know, we, we kind of hit it generic, right? And I begin to think about, uh, about, you know, that terminology becomes almost second nature to those who have been in... Um, in our circle for a while. Uh, we, we understand the language, we understand the terminology, and, uh, and I, think about, I think about this. In the South, we'd say something like, hey, praying for y'all. You know that, that if, if the Apostle Paul had been from the South, that's exactly what he said right here. I can prove it. I can prove it. What does y'all mean? You all. It means you all. All right, now, uh, look down with me, if you would, in, in verse number 4 in your Greek New Testament. Always, he said, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, verse number 3, always in every prayer of mine for you all. Is that what it says? Paul said, hey, praying for y'all. That's exactly what he said. He said, every time I pray for you, I'm praying for something for you. And so Paul was very specific here in his request as we, as we were looking. Now, again, I know oftentimes it comes down to here's what our prayer is. Lord, bless them. Lord, help them. Lord, meet their needs. God, touch the sick. Be with those that's in the hospitals. I, I, I understand. But, but have you ever wondered when people make that statement, what are they really praying for? Now, I'm not talking about, you know, and I, I believe this. I believe we have people in the church that pray for each other. I believe if you share a need, there are people in the church that remembers that need. Because here's how you tell. They usually ask you about it. You know, hey, how's so-and-so? How's, how's, your, how's your mom doing? Or how did this surgery go? Or how did this procedure go? Or this test? And, and, and so we understand. But I'm talking about when, you know, the Lord just lays somebody on your heart. And you really have no idea why. You really have no idea really even what to pray for. And so you begin to pray, but, but here's why you pray. You pray because you care about that person. Okay, now, when you come to Philippians chapter number one, Paul is praying for people that he loves. He's praying for people that he, that he cares about. Um, I, I, I got, uh, look at this. It, it's easy to see Paul's love and it's genuine. Listen to what verse number seven says. He said, even it is meet for me to think this of you all because I have you in my heart. Now, these people meant something to Paul. They meant something to Paul. And I begin to think about this. Think about how you pray for others versus how you pray for your children. Now, think about it. Now, and I'll tell you this. If your children are still in your home, you're going to pray for them differently when they get out of your home. It's a fact of the matter. I didn't understand that until my kids moved out. You're going to pray for your children differently now, or you pray for your children differently now than you will when they leave. Now, not the ones right, ones more spiritual. But when they live in your house, most of the time, you know what their needs are. Most of the time, you know what they're going through at school. And by the way, I would encourage you, be nosy, be involved in their life. They don't deserve privacy until they can pay for it. <laughs> Say, why? Man, it's a dangerous world we live in. We live in a place of predators and we live in a place of sickos. You need to be involved in every aspect of your kid's life. But, but me saying all that, I, I, I will say this. Most of the time in your home, though you may not be able to tell emotionally what they're going through, you can know their needs. They got a doctor's appointment. They got this, this. 
But when they move out of your house, there are times that you just go to, to, to God and say, God, I need you to touch this aspect of their life. Now, they may not be request, they might not even know they need prayer in that area. But God's put it on your heart. So you begin to pray specifically, but you do that with such a burden because they mean so much to you. And I'll say this tonight, that when we pray and when people are praying for us, I do believe that there are things that we ought to pray specifically for. Now, not only did Paul have a parent's heart, you know, Paul oftentimes referred to his converts as children, as his dear children. And so I believe we see Paul with the heart of a parent for their child. But I believe you also find Paul's heart to be the heart of a pastor. He was somebody that was worried about their spiritual well-being. He was someone that, uh, listen, physical needs are, are one thing, but a spiritual walk with God was another, and Paul was concerned about that walk. Paul was concerned about that spiritual condition and their spiritual well-being. And it's in this light, as that pastor's heart that Paul had, that I believe that we can look at the next few verses. And I hope that we can see that if these things uh, were important for their growth, then they're also important for our growth. If these things Paul was praying, he, he went to God on behalf of these people in some specific areas. And if it was important enough in their lives that Paul would take them to God, then it ought to be important enough to, in our lives that we ought to try to put in practice the things that Paul was asking God for. Picture this, if you would. Picture Paul on his knees in a Roman prison. Philippians is a prison epistle. Picture Paul on his knees in a Roman prison. And, uh, you know, his heart longs to see. The Bible tells us here his heart would rather be there. He's locked up in prison. He can't get to the people that he loves. His heart is there, but he can do the next best thing. He can take them to God. He can begin to pray for them, and his mind goes to the people that he loves. Even when he can't physically be together with them, he can take them before God. And he falls upon his knees, maybe in that prison cell. And he begins to pray, and he be, probably begins to recall their faces. That's how we do when we pray. You kind of see their face. You kind of imagine them. You kind of, uh, you kind of think about the situation, maybe where they met. Or uh, I, know, I know here, I, I can kind of think about where people sit. You know, we're Baptists, we have assigned seats. You know, we, 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 we pick our own seats and, you know, we have our own songbooks and we, uh, you know, we fix that. We just done away with songbooks. Uh, we're going to do away with pews. Everybody's going to be standing next Sunday. And uh, <clears throat> I'm just kidding. Um, but, but, you know, I, we can kind of imagine people. I imagine uh, when I look back over almost 20 years of being a pastor here, I imagine, I, I can almost go back in my mind when people first started coming. When people first started showing up and, and, and what it was like and, you know, the visits that you make and the calls that you make and, and the, the contacts and the connections. And then you begin to pray, God lead them and God lead us. And it's just, it, it's just a neat thing how that God brings a family together. And I can imagine Paul being the same way as he remembers leading this one to Christ. As he remembers uh, how he led Lydia to the Lord and maybe she went and, and led others in her village to Christ and brought him in and then he went back. I, I can just in my mind picture Paul on his knees thinking about these people and begin to pray and begin to, 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 to cry out in a very specific he said oh God I pray that and he begins his prayer and so as we read this context understand that Paul now he prays to God but then he does something pretty neat he writes to church and says hey I've been praying for you but here's what I've been praying about now before you think that that's not that's not maybe a little odd what would you do one morning if I, if I come to you and say, hey, I just want you to know I've been praying for you and your family. Preacher, I, Pastor, I appreciate that. We've had a lot going on. I pre I've been praying that God would call you to Moldova to full-time missions. Well, now, brother, I think you're meddling. <laughs> and I've been praying that you'd get right with brother so-and-so, uh, and I've been praying that you'd, you know, you'd stop hanging out at the, at the beer joint. I've been praying that you'd stop doing all these things. Because it's for your own good. Now what you'd do is you'd automatically maybe get defensive. Let me tell you something. Paul said, listen, let me tell you some areas that I've been specifically praying for you. Now, I don't believe that it was a negative thing. I don't believe anything he was calling them on the carpet, but it was things that Paul uh, could, could see that said, hey, I want to be cautious and I want you to be careful that you don't end up by the wayside and end up sidetracked. All right, so. Let's look at it. First of all, we find in verse number 9 in Paul's prayer, he said, I've been praying that your love may grow. That your love may grow. He said, in this I pray that your love may abound. Now remember he said, I, I'm praying 
verse 4, always in every prayer, but he said, this is what I'm praying. So he said, I'm praying for you, but then he tells them what he's praying for specifically. He said, number one, that you may, uh, or that, and this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more. That your love may abound more and more. Now, there's one thing for sure about the church in Philippi. They loved the cause of Christ. If you know anything about this church, you understand that this church gave out of their poverty. You'll find out that, that Paul said, once and again you gave into my poverty. Uh, they were listed in, in, as part of the churches of Macedonia uh, that gave to meet the needs of ministry. Why? Because they loved the cause of Christ. They believed in the cause of Christ. Uh, one of the greatest examples of a mission-minded, mission-given church is the church of Philippi. They desired to see souls saved. They wanted to see God's man taken care of. They wanted to give. Uh, listen, Paul almost had to, they almost had to beg Paul to take their offerings. And I mean, they, they loved the cause of Christ. And so Paul is not rebuking them for their love, but Paul is saying, I don't want that love to stop or to grow stagnant or to be settled. He said, I want you to abound more and more and more in this love. I'm going to tell you, that's a pretty good request. Paul said, listen, they've done great things, but man, I don't want to see them stop where they're at. I want to see them continue in this path. Now, we ought to be reminded again of their poverty, but we ought to take note that they, the Bible says of that church, those churches in Macedonia that they first gave of themselves. Before they gave a dollar out of their pocket, they'd give everything that they had to God. They first, that's, that is the, the caliber of the churches that you have in Macedonia, which was one of them was the church of Philippi. Yet Paul prays that they would increase in their love. I got to thinking about how we love. How we, and it is the agape love. It is a Godward, selfless love. That their love may abound. I thought about this toward one another. Paul said, listen, I, I don't, want, don't stop loving each other. Can I, can I say this as a church? One of the things that's killing the church today is people stop loving each other. We, 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 we cut, we run down, and I'm afraid that we're probably all a little guilty of it at times. But man, we can't stop loving each other. You think about, we, we have made an enemy. Uh, <clears throat> Facebook's a good revealer. Let me just tell you that. Facebook is a good revealer. Uh, I, I get so frustrated of, of preachers cutting preachers. I'm not talking about calling out sin. That's not what I mean. But man, they're, they're up and down on their little hobby horse about whatever preference it is. And, and if you don't, you know, just have this kind of, you know, you're not walking exactly with this crowd and holding hands with this crowd and you're not. Listen, let me tell you something. If that's not your crowd, then just be quiet and move on. Stick with your crowd. Call it a great day. Just call it a great day. Live your life in the liberty that God has given you to live and stop hindering the cause of Christ because we've decided to stop loving our brothers and sisters. I don't have to condone everything. There's a lot of stuff I don't condone. There's a lot of stuff you don't condone. I can promise you this, if anybody sees me preaching without a jacket on, there's some people that's going to throw me under the bus. Lucky for them, they ain't here. So preacher, lucky for me, I ain't coming back. Maybe not. But listen, we, we, we gotta, we gotta, listen we've got to start loving each other. Remember what it was like when you first got saved? There's nobody like the people of God. Now, there's nobody like the people of God. You just want to be around them. You just want to be in their presence. Uh, you, you knew they was imperfect, but you know what? You hadn't got over the fact that so were you. I think too many times we get over the fact that we're still imperfect and we get up on our self-righteous high horse and think we're better than somebody else and we don't make the kind of mistakes they make. And the problem is, is what that leads us to is we stop loving each other. He said, I want you to keep loving each other, that it may abound, that you may have an abundance of love one toward another. Now, what about this, that your love may abound for Christ? That your love may, be, may abound for Christ. I think it's kind of like this. Uh, you know, sometimes, I, I hope it's this way, but you know, sometimes in marriage, you, know, you, you get married and, and, you know, your wedding day and you're just all googly-eyed and, and happy and, you know, everything is just wonderful. And you think, I, I could never be in love with them more than I am today. Listen, you haven't, you haven't seen them sick with their head stuck in the toilet. You know, wake, waking up to noises that you just didn't think would ever even feasibly possible from a human being. And, and you, you, you lived through years of that. Been interesting at our house this week. 
You live through years of that. And then one day you roll over and that person, they don't look the same. They don't sound the same. They don't think the same. And it almost blows you away that you love them more then than you ever thought you could ever love somebody when you first got married. What happens, your, your love, if, if, if we're allowing God to work in our life, your love is abounding more and more. Listen, that's why you're able to tolerate some of that stuff. Because your love is, you wouldn't have tolerated that on the first day. You wouldn't have, you wouldn't have told, you'd been like, man, I, I need an annulment. This has got to go. Now you say, preacher, what are you saying? He said, listen, our love, think about this. When you get saved, you think about, man, I, 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 don't, I don't think I can love Jesus anymore than I love him right now. And then the longer you're saved, the more you get to know him. Well, the longer you're saved, the more he begins to prove himself to you and show him, not because he has to, but because he wants to. And then you get in his word and you learn about his character and you learn about his, his promises and you learn about his provision and you learn about the goodness of God and, and the protection of God and the faithfulness of God. And it seems like that you just love him more. And Paul said, listen, don't ever, that's why I'm praying that you love him more than you do now. And that, that love that you have keeps on. Their love for others, they gave. Paul said, your love for me, I hope it just keeps on and on and on. Your love for souls, your love for the work of God. He said, I just want your love to abound. Now, here's the thing about it. Paul's not praying for blind love. You say, what do you mean blind love? You know, God is not asking us to love him in vain or for no reason at all. I know we, we love him because he first loved us, okay? I understand that. But God is not asking us to just continue to love him more and more and more for no reason or with, with no basis behind that love. By the way, love does have a basis. There's a reason that you love that person that you are, are married to. It has a basis somewhere. All right, what is our basis? And again, we love him because he first loved us. But here's what Paul is saying. He said that you, that you love may abound yet more and more. But look what he says. There's two areas. In knowledge... And in all judgment, in knowledge, and in judgment. I got to look into those things. These are two areas that will help us to grow in our love relationship with God. First of all is in the area of knowledge. Now this word is not, is not to, to gain fact and, and information. That's, that's not what it's about. It's not about, okay, well, the smarter I get, the more, the more I'm going to love. That's not what it's about. Anytime this particular word for knowledge is used in the New Testament, it's in reference uh, to the eternal and the divine things. All right, so it's not just a knowledge. It's to, there's a lot of people in this world that have a lot of knowledge but nothing about the things of God. He said, but I want you to grow in love. And the more that you're tuned in to the divine things of God, the more that you're tuned in to the eternal matters of God, he said, that'll cause your love to flourish. Hey, is that not true? The more we get to know about God, the more we love him, the more we get to know about eternal things, the more we long for those days, the more we get to know those, it increases our love. When we understand that God loves his children and we understand why God loves his children, that ought to motivate us to love God's children because God loves them. All right, so he says in knowledge, man, we, we give ourselves more to know about God. Man, I, I believe our love for him and others will flourish. All right, number two, in judgment. The word judgment here refers to discernment, but in moral and ethical matters. In moral and ethical matters. Uh, listen, this is not really, I don't think what Paul was, was necessarily dealing with, although I think the next thing we're going to look at, it'll apply to that. Man, everything that this world defines as love is, is, is not love. Paul's not saying I, I, you, need to love and you need to increase your love by, by increasing your acceptance level to the things I call impure. No, that's not what he said at all. He said it, it's to love, uh, it's to have judgment in the moral and the ethical matters that you're going to face. All right, so increase in these areas. All right, then second of all, he said I'm praying for you that your love would abound. All right, number two, and I've got to hurry. He said that you may approve things that are excellent. So Paul's second prayer is he said, okay, now I want your love to abound. I want your love to increase. He said, but then I'm praying that God would give you some discernment to live your life. Now that's a pretty good thing to pray for is discernment. I mean, would to the Lord our society had a little more discernment. All right, but let's, let's bring this back to where we live. What about discernment in the church? Among church people, God's people, discernment among God's people. 
In short, he said, I want you to take the knowledge and the judgment that you abound in as pertaining to moral and ethical matters and put them to use in everyday decisions. He said, I want you to take this knowledge, this knowledge of the divine things, the knowledge of the eternal things, the judgment that God's give you on matters of, that are morally right and ethically pure. He said, I want you to take all of those things and he said, I want you to allow those things to shape the choices and the decisions that you make in your life. What shapes our choices? What shapes our decisions? Oftentimes it's whatever kind of things we've been indoctrinated with. It's, it's, the, it's the opinions and the views with which we adapt as, as that being a truth. And he said, so I want you to take that, those things that will increase your love in God. He said, but I want you to take those things and use that as the standard to make the decisions that you're going to make in life. The word approve literally means to see whether a thing is genuine by scrutiny or examination. Now, why is this vital? Because God doesn't expect his children to be ignorant on, on matters. He said, weigh them out. Now, <clears throat> I, can preach that, I, I can preach that with a negative tone, okay? But it doesn't take rocket science to figure out in this world the things that are right and the things that are wrong. But he says you need to weigh out the things just because you hear it in a religious setting that doesn't make it right either. And just because you hear it to be right, it might be wrong or vice versa. He said, so I want you to put them under scrutinization. I want you to, I want you to put them under the, under the spotlight, if you will. This word for approval here is used in testing of metals to weigh out the value in those metals. And he said, approve those things which are excellent. That means to distinguish between good and evil, lawful and unlawful. When did, the, when did the church become so mingled in their mind between that which is right and that which is wrong? I mean, we're, we're living, a, we say this all the time, we're living in a mixed up society. And we are. But I, I, I didn't think that there's some things that, that under the banner of religion that goes on that blows my mind. Blows my mind. And I, I just don't understand why and how in a clear conscience with an open Bible, and that's the second one is really the problem, how they can justify some of the decisions and choices, the things that they're calling good, the things that they're promoting is right. What happened? They're using no discernment by, by weighing them out, by putting them under the scrutiny of the pages of the Word of God. Paul said, I am praying that God would give you some discernment that you can do the things that you know to be right to do. Man, do you know what we need to do today? We need discernment that God would help us to live out that which we know to be right or that which God has said to be right. Let me, let me show you this because I like this. I want to draw your mind to a word in this verse that would seem to be insignificant. Now, I realize that nothing in the Word of God is insignificant. It's there for a purpose. It's there for a reason. And so don't leave here and say, preacher said some of the words are not significant. That, that's not what I mean. But it's one of those words that's easily skipped over. All right, if, you're, if you're reading this and you look, it's, it's a definite article. So if, you, if you're reading this in the original language, it's a definite article. That means it points to something specific. All right, but it's specifically in specific in this verse. And I'll prove it to you. So preacher, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it is because it points out something. And it doesn't give you the specifics of everything it points out, but it tells you specifically to be looking for this. You say, what's he say? All right, let's read it. That you may approve, what's that word say? Come on, what is it? Things. That you may approve things that are excellent. Now, the definite article refers to, it's usually pointed, it's usually understood as the word the. And so when the Bible, you know, that's one of the ways in the New Testament, by the way, if it's talking about little g gods or it's talking about the God, is this little definite article that'll be before that word. It's a little O with a rough breather on it. All right, and so you, you take this definite article, which would be not just God, but the God. Okay, it would be like saying, okay, um, we're going to go to a restaurant, which is generic, uh, but no, we're going to go to the restaurant. Like it's the top, it's the, it's the best that there is. All right, so it is a very specific, but he, he specifies this word that's not only used as the, it can also be used as this, that, or these. 
And so I, I was sitting there reading it. Almost, it almost made me chuckle. Because do you notice that Paul says here, I want you to use some discernment. He said, I want you to approve things that are excellent. He said, but I'm not going to tell you what things. You say, what is that? Because there's a lot of this, that's, and the others that pop up in our life that maybe we don't see them in red, white, and black, but God expects us to use his word to build some discernment and judgment in these issues. There, there are things that you're going to encounter in your life. You say, well, preacher, I don't, I don't find that in John chapter number 9. No, but you find the premise of how you got to live your life all through the pages of the New Testament. Build some discernment based upon the truth in which you have. And he said, so when you look, he said, I want you to approve things. What things? This, that, and these that may appear as you live your Christian walk. Now you think about this. There are things that have happened to you since you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ that you would have never in a million years foresee happen. When you got saved, you didn't think it ever happened. You wasn't thinking about sickness. You wasn't thinking about pain. You wasn't thinking about a brother in Christ hurting you. You wasn't thinking about a sister in Christ disappointing you. You wasn't thinking about any of that. You was just thinking, I got saved. Everybody loves Jesus. We're going to be happy forever. But this happened, and that happened, and all these things happened. You know what Paul said? He said, I want you to approve these things. I want you to prove the things that are excellent. He said, I want you to, everything that comes up in your life, I want you to put it under scrutiny. I want you to scrutinize it. I want you to look at it. I want you to, to distinguish between what's right and what's wrong. The things that, that you face as a believer that, that confront you, is this right? Is this wrong? Is this good for me? Is this bad for me? Is this pleasing to God? Is this, this ple Is this going to bring me closer to God or away from God? Paul said, I want you to approve the things that are excellent. He said, what things, Paul? Whatever it is you encounter, I want you to be able to use some discernment in your life. The things that you know to be right and wrong, good and evil, I want you to use some discernment in approving those things. Man, how much does this and that, this and that pop up in our life? How many times are we faced with a decision? And you might not know the chapter reference. You might not know what book it's found in. But you know that there's a premise in the word of God that says, you know, I just don't think that's healthy for me to do. I just don't think that's going to be beneficial. Or maybe you're on the backside of doing it. And you say, you know what? That really wasn't the best thing for me to do. I need to go back and make that right. I need to go back and fit. You know what is that? That's approving those things which are excellent. That's making discernment and decisions about that which is right in the sight of God and lawful and good and that which is pleasing in the sight of God. He said, so I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. All right, then what about this one? Verse number 10, the latter part, he said, also I'm praying that you'd be sincere and without offense. Sincere and without offense. Paul prays here for their personal well-being. He's not praying for their health, but he's praying for their character their character how important is it that God's people have the right character the, I mean the right character I mean we're representatives of him right we're representatives of him and regardless of, of what we think or whether we care what people think or not at the end of the day we're representatives of him and so Paul prays that they'd have the right character about their life as they go Throughout this, by, by the way, do you realize this church had a good testimony? Anytime something has a good testimony, you know what, you know what Satan's target is? Destroy their testimony. Ruin them, ruin their testimony. Why? Because that'll do harm to the cause of Christ. It's not about them. He, he, Satan can care less about them, about you, about anybody. But if he can use you to harm the cause of Christ, he will. Man, Paul prays for their character. Two words here that we mentioned are sincere and that phrase without offense. These are two areas and tactics that I believe that Satan can use to sidetrack or sideline a believer. To sidetrack or to sideline a believer. All right, so let's look at him. He says, be sincere. Now, that, what, that, that doesn't mean, you know, that, well, do the best you can and as long as you mean it, God knows your heart. That's not what that means. 
The word sincere here means to be pure or unsullied. Now, you say, well, unsullied. I, I, I looked it up, but it's a good word. Uh, when it gave me the definition for sincere, it, it used that. So I just want to give it to you. Uh, it simply means not stained or tarnished, not disgraced, free from imputation of evil. In other words, nobody's got any, nobody's got any dirt on you. He said, I want, you to, I want you to stay sincere. I want you to stay pure. It's a word that's used to describe unmixed substances. You know, it's be kind of like a lady holding the ring up. And of course, again, I used this the other day, but you know, this is silicone. Uh, but saying, hey, wow, that is pure gold. Doesn't have any, you know, it, it, you know that's, that's a pure diamond. It doesn't have any cubic zirconia slipped in around it. It's, it's, it's pure, it's whole. That is pure. Now, you know, we in this area would take a drink of tea and say, man, that is pure sugar. But we know that's not true because it's got tea in it. It's mixed. It's not pure sugar. It might be close. It might be close, but it's not pure. But it, it means unmixed. That it, man, it, that's that's all it is. You know, it's it's just it's just pure. It's, can I tell you something about our character? We ought to be just pure. Uh, all we are is what God. But we're just pure. All right now, and so it's a word that means it means pure. Uh, it, it's a word that references being unfolded, such as you would a garment. But here's the key, and holding it up to the light. You ever, you ever tried to see something? Somebody said, man, I spilled something on my shirt. And you can't see it, but when you hold it up to the light, oh, yeah, there it is, there's that stain. Or, man, yeah, I can, I can see that, that's bad. Well, you, well, just, you know, you can't see it if you just don't, just stay in the dark all the time. But, you know, you hold it up to the light, and you say, oh, yeah, no, I can't see it, it's gone. There, there's no spot there, it's okay. All right, well, I thought about this when I was, when I was studying I have the hardest time keeping my glasses clean. You know, if you had eyebrows like these and a nose like this, you'd understand why. You know, I got a big old nose and big bushy eyebrows and I can't grow hair on my head. I can't help it. And so this nose pushes these glasses up to them eyebrows. And when I'm sweating or I'm hot, you can just do the math on the rest. All right, I can move them, but they'll slide. I can't help it. It just is what it is. And we'll, we'll be some, and I just get used to them. I'll just be honest with you, I get used to them. And uh, some of you look better when my glasses are dirty. <laughs> I can't see any of you now, they're dirty, so I don't know what you're thinking. But we'll get in the car, Libya, like, how do you, how do you even see in out of your, your glasses are filthy. How do you even see out of them? I was like, well, I don't know, I've been looking at them all day. And I'll take them off, Brother Terry, and I'll say, yeah, they're a little dusty, but here's what I'll do. I was like, man, them are dirty. Y'all ever done that? Held your glasses up to a light? Those of you with bad eyes, the rest of you, you're like in people I saw walking around. I told Libby, I said, all them feel-gooders out there walking around flaunting that they feel good in front of me and I feel like trash. A bunch of feel-gooders, a bunch of see-gooders. But you hold them things up to the light. You know, every fleck of dust, every smudge, smear, imperfection, every run of sweat that's on them, when you hold that up to the light, man, you can see everything. Everything. When you try to clean them and hold them up, you say, man, I cannot get that one smudge off of there. I've cleaned them glasses six times. I'm just going to live with it because they're cleaner than they were before. What happens? The light is a revealer. Our lives ought to be so sincere, so pure, that when we're held up to the light, we're clean. We're pure. So that when the world sees us as a testimony that we're children of God, we are a reflection of what God has done. And Paul said, I'm praying for you about that. I'm praying for you about that. May our actions stand up in the light. Then he says, be without offense. A couple of different words, that phrase, or a couple of different ideas behind that phrase. Here it is, not led into sin or blameless, it's without stumbling. It would seem that he's referencing their steadfastness in the faith. That they don't allow anything to come that would cause them to stumble. I want to take a time out for just a second. What's it going to take to make you stumble? What will it take? A lot of times, just from what I witness, it's usually other people. We get our mind on other people. We, and we can't move past other people. 
They done me wrong. They said this. They said that. They wasn't in the right. They did it. And everything you say may be 100% true. But why are you allowing that to cause you to stumble? God didn't do that to you. There's a lot of times people blame God. Get upset at God. Get mad at God. God's unfair. God did this. God did this. And we don't see God in the light of, of the grace of God and the mercy of God and a God of providence. And we allow those things to cause us to stumble. He said, I'm praying for you that you'll live your life without offense, that you won't be made to stumble. You won't be made to where now that life is tainted. That life is scarred with sin that when you hold your life up to the light, it no longer is pure. He said, I'm praying for you that you don't do that. Of course, the other indication is that we don't cause other people to stumble. It's t- it's, isn't it tough? I mean, if we're honest... You know, it, 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 it seems like sometimes it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter what you say. You're going to be wrong. It don't matter. If you apologize to somebody, you did it in the wrong tone. You did it the wrong day. You was wearing the wrong color socks when you done it. It's like you, you can't make some people happy. It, it's just, and it's like, you know, well, I can't win for losing. I, I just can't win. And, and, and you say something, and it didn't, you didn't even mean what they say. And man, they took offense to it. I I, I tell you what needs to happen a lot. This is is not in Philippians 1. This is a little Christology. But we need to grow up on some of that stuff. You know, we need to to be as far along in in our lifestyle as what, what we profess to be with our mouth. What we're putting out there on a social media post about how much we love Jesus and how much we care and hold God and His providence and you know oh I'm just I got if y'all post this I don't know but you know you see ten thousand posts of their morning devotion sipping coffee y'all seen them y'all, y'all know what I, I mean and it makes me jealous because some of them's by the lake or by the ocean I'm like I didn't even want to see that mess <laughs> enjoy your stinking coffee. But I, and that's, that's awesome. But don't you think that ought to live up to the life that they're living? Right. Instead of just an image we're trying to portray. Now, by the way, I ain't referring to anybody's post. I don't know who's posted about coffee drinking at the beach. I, I don't know. I, I know we got some families at the beach. If y'all posted that this morning, God bless you. Enjoy your coffee. Um, but y'all get what I'm saying. We're easy to put on this big facade about how spiritual we are, and we let the smallest, little, minutest, foolish things cause us to stumble. We're mad at people in the house of God. We can't look them in the eye, and we're too proud to go to them and make it right. It's Wednesday night, and that didn't cost y'all nothing. That was free. But I'm telling the truth. We won't go to them. We won't go. They, they don't have a clue. They ought to know. They don't know. Look, if I'm dumb enough to say it and don't come to you, let me tell you something. I'm dumb enough not to know. And it's your responsibility, according to the Bible, it's your responsibility to come and let me know. And if you know and don't come let me know, according to the pages of Scripture, you're just as wrong as I am. You realize that you have a response. I don't know why I'm hitting this, but I'm here. I just might as well shoot him and, and just move on. You realize that, that there's as, as equal responsibility for the offended and the offendee to go tell the other one. Yeah. Neither one's off the hook. Right. He gives instruction that if I've offended somebody, I need to go and make it right. But if I've been offended, I have a responsibility as a child of God to be mature enough to go and say, hey, I have been offended. But I've also got to be willing to accept when that brother says, that sister says, that individual says, man, I didn't mean to, I, I apologize. They don't mean it. How many times? Some, somewhere in there about 70 and, uh, and, and times and, and seven. He said, I'm praying for you that you live without offenses, either giving them or receiving them. Now, why do you think Paul put that in there? Because how easy... Is it to either be offended or be the offender? Listen, we need, to, we need to grow up in the things of God and we need to learn to handle ourselves and to live the way that God would have us to live as a reflection of who Jesus is. 
You say, well, how long does he mean that? Well, he says until the day of Christ. That means we're just going to have to keep getting right and being right and living right and walking right and dealing with the things as they come our way. Things that we never thought we'd have to encounter. All right, and then he says that your lives will be fruitful. This, will be, this one will be quick. I told Libby, I said, I'm probably not even going to preach long. and I'm feeling pretty good. <laughs> he said, being filled, verse 11, with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. The word filled means to be furnished or liberally supplied. To, fill, to be filled with the fruits of right, be liberally su supplied. That righteousness means integrity, virtue, purity of life, uprightness, correctness in thinking, feeling, and acting. He said, I want you to be filled with the fruits that's produced from this. I want you to be, I want you to be dripping with the evidence of integrity. Dripping with the evidence of virtue. Dripping with the evidence of a pure life, of correct thinking, feeling, and acting. He said, I want you to be filled with the evidence of those things. Fruits is that which originates or comes from that. It's a result of. It's the evidence of or the work or activity. In other words, it's coming out in how you live your life. Again, you can hear Paul's voice praying, can't you? Dear God, I pray that their deeds, I pray that their works, I pray that their actions are filled with those things of integrity, purity of life. God, I pray that it comes out in their deeds as they, handle, as they handle the crowd at work. I pray that it comes out in their actions as they're dealing with one another. I pray that it comes out in their works as they're laboring in, in the workplace, as they're laboring at the house of God. God, I pray that everything is a consummation and what's in them is what's coming out of them. He said, I'm praying for you. I want you to know I'm praying for you. I, I want what's best for your life. I, I don't want you to be a, a depleted, bitter, dried up Christian. I don't want you to be a fruitless Christian that makes no positive impact for the things of Christ. He said, I want you to know I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. You realize this is only possible to achieve in the lives of people because of their influence and relationship with Jesus Christ. Look what he says. I'm praying for you. <laughs> Being filled with the fruits of righteousness, look what it says, which are by Jesus Christ. You see that? There's no other way to get them. There's no other way to have these good deeds. There's no other way to live in such a fashion. The only way to get it is by and through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Here's the thing. If we profess to know him, then we have access to the supply of his ability. It's only possible through him. Here's the next thing. This type of life brings glory and praise to God. Your life's not going to bring glory and praise to God while I'm over here doing my own thing. Look what he says. He says, unto the glory and the praise of God. Paul said this, I wish more than anything that I could be there with you. Man, I, I love to see you. I love to fellowship with you. I, I love to sit down and enjoy a meal together. I love to, you know, to be able to go out and, and, and tell you, your friends and loved ones what's going on in, in my life. He said, I, he said I, I'd love to be, he said, but I can't. He said, I want you to know something. I, I am praying for you. You know, if Paul could have been there, Paul would have been preaching to him. But when Paul could, couldn't be there to preach to him, Paul was on his knees praying for him. And what he was praying for was the same thing that he had been preaching. And he said, listen, I, I, I want you to have the discernment of God in your life. I want, I want you to abound in the love. I want you to love God more. I want you to love Christ more. I want you to love the brethren more. I want you to love the... I don't want, that to, I don't want you to ever lose that love. I want it to abound more and more and more. I want you to use the discernment that you get from that knowledge and judgment into whatever things may come up that you'll handle yourself and conduct yourself like a cause of Christ. And I want you to be filled with the fruits of righteousness. He said, that's my prayer for you. So I wonder tonight, if Paul wrote these letters and was approaching God on their behalf so that they would accomplish these things, don't you think they'd be important in our life that we'd accomplish them? That we would abound more and more in the love, the love for God, the love for our brethren, that we would have some spiritual discernment in our lives as things come, as we present them with things in society, that we can make the right choices to call good, uh, to call good, good, and evil, evil. And then that we might abound and that we might be filled, if you will, with the fruits of, of righteous, the evidence of righteousness in our life because it brings glory to God.
maybe tonight we're going to stand. Miss Stephanie, if you'll come, we're going to stand and she'll just play a verse or two of invitation. We're going to close and go to the house. But maybe tonight if God's spoke to your heart, you just like to slip out right from where you're at and say, God, I sure want you to, I sure want to be what you want me to be. And Lord, there might be some things in my life that I need to, to get right, some, some areas that I need more discernment in. I'm, I'm dealing with things, God, that I can't necessarily find the, the book reference. I can't never necessarily find the specific, but I, I know, God, that there's, there's principles in the Scripture. And God, would you help me as I deal with these things? Maybe tonight you just want to come and ask God to help you to be filled with the fruits of righteousness. If you're here on this Wednesday night and you don't know 100% sure that you're born again, and tonight it'd be a good night to come and get saved.